Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Lunchtime Discovery Series brought to you by the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for joining us here on today's program. My name is Chris Smith. I am your host. I am the curator for the SECU Daily Planet Theater at the museum in downtown Raleigh. Uh, but right now, I am your host for our special Wednesday noontime lectures. So I uh, hope you've got your lunch ready to go. You've got some snacks. You've got a drink to sit down, learn something new with us. Uh, today, we've got a really cool show. Uh, we're going to have three guest speakers who are going to share their insights, experiences, knowledge, and expertise, having worked aboard a research vessel and done work with the oh-so-famous submersible submarine diving technology, Alvin. Maybe you heard of this. Uh, I feel like if you keep up with like science and environment news at least a little bit, all the time, there are new discoveries and cool research projects and news-making headlines coming out of this submersible Alvin and the research vessel, uh, which I think is called Atlantis, that it's a part of. And uh, for somebody like me, who works in a natural history museum and really digs all of the cool things that we get to learn about our planet, uh, Alvin has brought us incredible insights. And so today it's really exciting to get to meet some folks and hear from them about what it was like to work on Alvin, what it's like to work on these research vessels out at sea, and a little bit about the research that they've undertaken to help us learn more about planet Earth. Uh, let me bring our three guests into the show one by one real quick so that you can meet them. And then I'll turn everything over to them for their presentation. First off, let's meet Ian Grace. Ian, welcome. Yeah, thanks, Chris. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for everybody uh, joining us. We're really excited to talk about our experience. Um, just to kind of kick off why we're, why we're here in the first place, a couple months ago, back in February and extending through March, we went on a research cruise in the Gulf of Mexico and into the uh, onto the East Coast. And um, we really want to talk about uh, some a little, a little bit about the research that we've done, but also kind of uh, what we're doing there, what it's like to be a scientist there. Uh, really looking forward to sharing that with you. All right. Thanks, After Chris. Ian, you'll be meeting Leslie Smith. Leslie, welcome. Hi. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for being here. And then Aurora Myers. Hi. Thank you. I'm so glad you could all three be here. Uh, thanks for agreeing to participate in today's program. But I think uh, you know we've got a great crowd over here on YouTube that I can see uh, people talking up in the chat. Let me remind everybody that you can use the chat box here on YouTube in order to leave your questions and comments for our guest speakers. When we get to the end of their presentation, I'll be grabbing those questions from the chat to pose to them. So leave your thoughts, type everything up there as we go, and we'll have plenty of time after the show for conversation. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, Ian, take it away. All right, thanks. Yep, I'll share my screen here, and we'll get started. Yeah, so thanks, Chris, again, for having us, and uh, we're really looking forward to sharing this with you. Again, I'm Ian Grace, graduate student researcher at North Carolina State University, and I'm joined by Leslie Smith and Aurora Myers, two undergraduate research assistants at North Carolina State. So just to kind of give you a, an idea of what this talk is about, I kind of alluded to this uh, just a minute ago, but um, I study the deep sea, uh, specifically methane seeps, which are just hot spots of life in the deep sea, and I'll introduce that in a second. Uh, and I also study something called larval dispersal, and that means the movement of animal populations between methane seeps. And I'll, again, I'll introduce those two concepts in just a second and talk about the research aspect of this presentation. That being said, that's not the main goal of this presentation. The main goal of this presentation is to talk about the lifestyle of science, um, what we were doing on board, Atlantis, RV Atlantis, research vessel Atlantis. Um, what life was like aboard, so Leslie's going to talk about that. She'll give you a ship tour as well and kind of talk about her experiences aboard and, and what it was like to, to um, do science in a kind of unique environment. And then after that, Aurora is going to talk about uh, the really fascinating HOV human-occupied vehicle, Alvin, 
That's our deep sea submersible that we use. And uh, what it was like for her to dive uh, towards the end, we'll bring in um, maybe my dive as well. She'll give you a sub tour, talk about the limitations, but also the abilities of Alvin, uh, the safety of diving, and, and just, again, what it was like to try to give you a perspective of, of, of being down there. And then at the very end, I'll narrate a video, a dive video that we've created that should hopefully give you a really good idea of what a typical dive day looks like. Um, it'll have some nice deep sea shots. Uh, you'll see some life down there and just kind of what it's like to, uh, to dive. Okay. So I'll kick it off. Uh, the deep sea is the largest biome on earth. I'm sure you've heard that phrase many times or at the very least, you know, the ocean is massive and covers a huge portion of the world. And that's true, it's not an understatement. This is the Pacific Ocean. It's not our uh, study domain, but this is just to show you how large it is. And the coastline only comprises a very small portion of the available uh, ocean volume. And so you have this wide open abyssal plains to, to work with and have, have uh, really interesting discoveries and lots of life. So here are some things you might see in the deep sea. The top right picture there is actually a hydrothermal vent, which is not what we study. But um, those are another, uh, that's another example of a, a hot spot of life. The rest of these pictures are from methane seeps, which is what I study. Um, you can see the, the very interesting fauna. You have bubblegum coral up in the top left there. Um, and you have some ophioroids, which are these spindly, uh, almost tentacle-esque creatures that live uh, in the deep sea, and especially on this fan coral that you see down there. Bacterial mats in the bottom left mussels on the bottom right. And you can actually see some methane seepage, some methane bubbles coming up through the sediment in the middle right picture there. All examples of, of places you might see in the deep sea. So what are methane seeps? I keep saying that, but what are they? So they're essentially methane seepage, so methane coming up from the sea floor um, that are found on continental margins. Uh, they happen uh, for a variety of reasons that I won't get into, but you can find them virtually everywhere. They're the result of geologic or sub seafloor bacterial processes. And all that means is you have methane coming up from the sediment and being utilized by bacteria um, that uh, turn it into uh, essentially energy, ways for organisms to survive down there. And so, for example, the mussels that live down there oxidize sulfide for energy. So that sulfide is a product of, of methane um, bacterial processes. And they're able to survive down there without light. So we call that a chemosynthetic community a community of animals that is actually synthesizing chemicals to survive. In the bottom right picture there, there's a zoomed in view of, of a methane seep. And that's kind of what it looks like in some situations. You see these plumes of bubbles just coming up from the ground and life kind of surrounds it. So let's talk about why the deep sea is important. Why are we here? Why do we care about it? Why do people fund us to, to research something that may at first feel very disconnected from anything else we could possibly study or anything pertaining to our daily life. Well, for one, you know, with all the CO2 we're emitting, the, the deep sea sequesters about a third of it. Um, so you have photosynthesis occurring in the, in the surface and eventually you have the carbon um, uh, sinks to the bottom as a result of this photosynthesis and the organisms um, accumulating carbon and they eventually sink. So it sequesters a ton of the carbon that we emit and if we didn't have it, we'd be in an even worse environmental situation than we are today. Second, huge oil and gas reserves um, reside on, on the sea floor. We know that very well. And then uh, particularly for uh, deep sea canyons, you can have um, huge hotspots of life that, that aren't even necessarily seeps or hydrothermal vents, but just have a whole lot of organisms in one area thanks to these, these canyons um, that can contribute to fisheries. So for example, the deep sea red crab here. And then there are other resources, and I won't get into this too much, but there's things like methane hydrate, manganese nodules, which you may have heard of that in the future we could actually harvest um, given some technological um, advancements. And we could essentially exploit the deep sea more than we are currently with, with fishing and trawling and, and oil and gas extraction and so on. So we do have on the horizon a, a future of deep sea exploitation. And it's something to keep in mind and the research we're doing often uh, comes back to that. How are we going to conserve the deep sea? Something we already know very little about, but we want to understand enough to know how we could impact it. So it's, it's a tough question, but that's more or less why we're, why we're here. 
So to understand the, the potential impacts we could have on the deep sea, let's talk about this term called connectivity. And I'll explain this slowly, um, so, so hopefully this makes sense. Let's start with a population, uh, an ecosystem or a habitat. This is a methane seep. This is a picture from one of our dives. Let's, let's consider this to be like site one or site A, okay? Site one could be connected to another site. What's connecting those two sites? Well, that is larvae. These are the juvenile, the embryonic forms of fish and mussels and other organisms, not only in the deep sea, but just in the entire marine environment. Okay, very small. This is only 300 micrometers. So you can't really see them unless you're looking through a microscope. But you have this mass of larvae that are traversing or migrating to another site. Okay. And so with all these larvae, you might consider these two sites to be highly connected, especially if this blue site was to also give larvae back to the white site. But let's assume that we just have this one directional um, dispersal or one directional connectivity for now. Okay. So let's move on. Let's say we have another site that's connecting to our original site. Okay. But we have uh, much fewer larvae traveling to this site. So let's say that that has a roughly like moderate connectivity. Okay. Let's continue this. Only <clears throat> four larvae are traversing to the green site. So let's say that has low connectivity. And then we have all of two larvae, for example, traveling back to the original site. Now, these aren't the actual quantities of larvae that are, that are traveling around. We have millions and millions and millions of larvae all traveling around. This is just an analogy. But you can see how uh, quantity of larvae can kind of drive connectivity or the level of connectivity. And of course, this is simplified, but hopefully you get the point here. So we're essentially looking at how well each site is connected, such that if we say remove one site, well, then we lose the larvae that are being given to the green site, and now that green site has no way of getting larvae, right? And in a realistic context, maybe it has very, very few ways or many fewer ways to get larvae, and it starts to kind of die off and, and not do so well, especially if it's impacted well, it can't regenerate, right? Okay, and so we lose some larvae going to the original site. Okay. Now the larvae that were originally going to this red site down here are just kind of floating off in space and they, they're just going to be gone. So we really have to know how impacts in one area affect neighboring sites. So for example, if we were to exploit any given site, how that would impact another site. Um, if you think of it as a network that can be uh, full of strings that can be pulled and, and adjust other strings, positions, and tightness and so on. That's a pretty good analogy. It's a web of interactions that we're studying, and that's connectivity. So one way we can study connectivity is by inference, um, not actively studying, oh, is this site connected to this site, but looking back and saying, well, have we seen muscles that have traversed from this site to this site? And we can look at their elemental uptake, their shell composition um, to uh, explain that, and this is how. So as a shell develops, for example, a larval shell, it accumulates elements from seawater as it develops, okay? It's a calcium carbonate shell, okay? And so it accumulates elements and stores it in the shell. So it's a solid record of salinity and temperature because with different salinities, different temperatures, we actually accumulate different elements or elements in different concentrations, okay? And this allows us to infer the environments that they experienced throughout their migration pattern, throughout their, um, their uh, uh, traversal to different sites. Okay. So in order to study this, and it's not terribly important that you fully understand the, the research here. Um, again, this presentation is more about the field work, but uh, we're out here to study larval dispersal. We're out here to study connectivity. We're diving down to sites to collect mussels to study them um, for their elemental compositions. Okay. So we started here down on the bottom left in Gulfport, Mississippi. We hit some sites in the Gulf of Mexico, came around the Florida Peninsula, stopped at Fort Lauderdale for an at-sea exchange of crew, science crew, and that's where Leslie and Aurora joined, and that's where we'll start off in a second. We came up here all the way to Baltimore Canyon, just off the coast of Maryland, and then came all the way back to Marhead City, and that's where we finished, roughly a three-week cruise. All right. So again, we're going to be talking about field work. We'll talk about life on Atlantis, and we'll talk about using HOV Alvin and what it was like, and some challenges, difficulties, the fun parts of it, the not-so-fun parts of it, hopefully give you an idea of what it's like to live as a scientist in a kind of a different environment. All right, so I'll hand it off to Leslie here. She'll talk about the at-sea transfer 
and uh, what it was like to get on Atlantis just off the coast of Fort Lauderdale. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. So the NC State crew boarded Atlantis in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, we had what was called an at-sea transfer. So what this means is that we went to the U.S. towboat and they took us out to Atlantis. And whenever we got there, they threw this huge ladder over the side, which you'd see in the right side picture. And we climbed up the ladder to board Atlantis, which is this fun, exciting start to our adventure. Uh, and then once we were on board, we uh, adhered to a specific schedule. Um, so we would wake up at 6.30 a.m. or at least try to. Uh, this picture is what our rooms looked like. We had a uh, bunk mate. So Aurora was actually my bunk mate. Um, the beds weren't super comfortable, but usually that's not an issue for me. My big problem was the noise. <laughs> um, so I had a hard time sleeping because uh, whenever the conditions were a little bit too rough, um, you were rolling around a lot, and then there was this huge wham noise. Uh, it sounded like an elephant knocking over a file cabinet, which is pretty much just uh, a huge wave hitting the back side of the ship. So after we tried to wake up at 6.30, we'd go to breakfast at 7. Um, and then from 7.30 to about 9, we would go outside uh, to watch the album launch. This is a really busy, exciting time. We're talking to our friends and excited for our friends who are about to go on Alvin. Uh, the Alvin crews hustling, bustling, trying to get everything ready. And there are actually two swimmers who are about to get on, to, on Alvin and help unhook the submersible so it can uh, go down. After that, we go back to work. Uh, we work for, from 9 to 11.30 in the lab. This is actually a picture of the main lab. The majority of us are hard at work, with the exception of somebody playing ping pong in that back corner, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, and then break for lunch at 11.30. Uh, which is always exciting because meal times are one of our most favorite times of the day. And then from 1235, we would go back to work. Uh, this picture is actually of the documentary team's workstation uh, where they would take the films or they take video clips from the Alvin dive and then they would piece them together for a really cool short film for all of us. And then there are also other grad students in addition to Ian from different universities who are working on a variety of different projects. And they would give lectures on their research and how what we're doing helps them out. And also there were some uh, really cool scientists that were on board that would give us some lectures as well. Uh, 5.30 is around the time that Alvin would resurface. Uh, we'd retrieve them. And then uh, we had a couple jobs to do before we could go to dinner. Um, we have to remove the animals and, and take out certain suction samples, but I'll talk about that a little bit more and in more detail on the next slide. Go to dinner. Afterwards, we would have a post-dive debriefing where we'd all crowd in the library. Uh, the scientists that went on Alvin would explain what happened during the dive, how uh, equipment deployment went, and what we should be doing for the rest of the night. And then at 7.30, we would just work. We'd do lab work until sometimes midnight. Uh, this is another picture of the main lab, and this is some grad students who are dissecting muscles, working very hard for uh, graduate research. Um, and as I mentioned before, there were certain jobs that we had to do once we were on Alvin. We were sorted into teams. So when Alvin was put back in the hangar, there was the bio box team. And so they'd come out with large buckets of cold seawater and they would remove animals from the two boxes in the front of Alvin. After that, the suction team, which we have so much technology, it's great, but the suction team had to take this large tube and suck seawater and sediment samples <laughs> out of Alvin and risk getting that nasty seawater in their mouth. Um, and then after they did that, uh, the sieve team would take the sediment and uh, sort out different sizes with different sizes of mesh, put all those samples into buckets to give to the sorting team, uh, which is what Aurora and I were on as well. Um, and so with sorting, you either sorted through larger marine animals like mussels, snails, things you could hold in your hand, um, or you would be on the microscope and you'd be sorting through sediment to find the larvae that Ian described in his research. And of course, Last but not least, uh, the documentary team, which had this really important job of putting together uh, the important clips, highlights of the dives, and just fun tidbits that happened during the dives as well. to help us who weren't able to go on Alvin feel like we were there with our friends. Um, there were a lot of unexpected aspects to, Al to Atlantis. I wasn't sure what to expect. I definitely wasn't expecting sailor showers. 
fresh water is a precious resource. Um, so <laughs> that includes <laughs> whenever you're taking a shower, the red light that you see is actually a heat lamp because you get in the shower, you get wet, you turn the water off, lather up, turn the water back on, rinse off, and that's your shower. That's it, that's all you get. <laughs> um, but the food was delicious. Uh, the cooks on Atlantis were very skilled in what they did. Uh, they were able to be super flexible about different types of cuisine. They did sushi, um, Chinese food, we had pizza. And if you really liked the food on Atlantis, you could even buy a cookbook out of the gift shop before you left. Um, next was restricted internet. We had very limited internet, very limited contact with the outside world. Um, you had probably enough to check your email, scroll through social media a little bit, and that was about it. So I had to take a physics test while I was on Atlantis, and um, I sacrificed all of my internet just that one day to be able to study. And finally, we all had these kind of preconceived notions of formality. So we thought there would be really strict rules and regulations and we wouldn't interact much with the crew and it was the complete opposite. Uh, it was actually pretty casual. The crew was very friendly, the Alvin crew and the ship crew, both um, very interesting people. We'd sit down and have dinner with them at night and talk about how they got where they are and their experiences working on Atlantis and Alvin and uh, the amount of trust between the crew and the scientists was really amazing. Um, but our experience on Atlantis was unique, mainly because of the weather conditions <laughs> that we experienced. So the video that should be playing right now is actually, actually a much nicer day <laughs> than what we experienced. You can see kind of the sea spray um, that's taken off by the wind. We actually, on our worst day, we had 20 foot waves, which is a lot of fun. And it kind of made traveling a little difficult because of the way that we were traveling into the waves we went diagonally against the waves. So not only were you getting that up and down, you're getting the rolling around motion. It's part of why I couldn't sleep. <laughs> um, uh, due to this, we had to switch some of our dive schedules around a little bit. At one point we had two dives in one day. We had one in the morning, one afternoon. Um, but due to these conditions, uh, we actually had quite a bit of free time. Um, so as I mentioned before, we were able to explore the ship. So we could go up to the bridge uh, whenever we wanted to. We could call the bridge if we wanted to, or if we needed to talk to them about something. Um, the picture on the right is actually Alvin. That's what the hangar looks like all night long, always super illuminated, lit up like a Christmas tree. And half the time, like one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, if scientists aren't doing anything, they're sitting outside looking at Alvin, and just in awe and talking to each other. Like, I can't believe this is actually our experience. Another cool thing we could do is go out on the deck and watch for bioluminescence at the front of the ship, which was tricky because one of the rules was that you couldn't use like your flashlight on your phone. So you're walking around in the dark trying to make it to the front of the ship so you can watch for bioluminescence. Sometimes it was there, sometimes it wasn't. Unfortunately, I didn't get to see it, but it was really nice to walk out and talk to everybody. Another fun aspect was ping pong tournaments. So this is the ping pong table that's in the main lab of Atlantis. Um, and what you can see is our friend Dan there, he's in the orange shirt. He's overcompensating for the movement of the ship before he hits the ping pong ball back to our friend Pat. Um, so the magenta line that you see, that's a regular vertical axis. That's like what we have right now. So the yellow axis is actually what the ship's <laughs> vertical axis was. So we were about 15 to 20 degrees off kilter um, in this picture specifically. Serial parties were also a very fun part of being on Atlantis. So if you've been staring into a microscope for four or five hours and you need a break, um, hey guys, let's go get some cereal. Uh, cereal supplies were available 24 seven in the galley, cereal and sandwich supplies. So if you were done with the night, you're like, man, I want some cereal. Go upstairs, take a break, have some Captain Crunch, chat with your friends. It was, it was it always made for a fun night. And then last but not least, I love drawing on cups. This is one of my favorite activities. We all brought styrofoam cups with us uh, and we would color them with markers. We'd make them for our friends, for our families, or maybe even keepsakes for ourselves and we put them in that blue mesh bag that you see in the bottom left hand corner and attach them to Alvin. And then whenever Alvin resurfaced, we could go get our cups and they would be shrunk down to uh, 
down to the picture that you see in the bottom right hand. Um, and of course, I have to mention wildlife spotting. So the video that you should be seeing right now, um, that's actually a picture of dolphins, the best picture of dolphins I've ever taken in my life. I'm super proud of it. Uh, this was in the Atlantic Ocean. Whenever there was something of interest to scientists going on, going on outside, the bridge would always call down and say, hey, there's dolphins off the port side and we'd run outside and try and catch them. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a video, but we did see a whale. We were all in the library and the bridge called down, said, hey guys, so there's a whale off the starboard side. We all ran out trying to find a way out, trying to find this whale. Unfortunately, it was too far away for me to take pictures or videos, but it was the first whale I ever saw. So it is an important experience. All right, and I'll hand it over to Aurora to talk about Alvin. Thank you, Leslie. So the Alvin is this amazing piece of state-of-the-art equipment that allows scientists to dive down deep to the seafloor and get a really up-close view of what's going on in these complex environments. Alvin lets you physically see the chemical and biological interactions that occur at these extreme depths. This in itself is an engineering feat. You can see on the left, that's a front view of Alvin. You can see it's two robotic arms that are strong enough to crush rock, yet they can be gentle enough to pick up a live sponge. You can also see the basket on the front of Alvin. That's used to hold instruments and bring samples back to the ship. This basket is config configured daily based on the dive's needs. Now looking at the side view of the ship, of the sub, you can see the white paneling. This is actually foam and it's used to help Alvin control its buoyancy. It, at the bottom of the sub, this is actually taken off to expose the circuitry. And all this circuitry is immersed in oil to negate the pressure changes of going down so deep. And looking at the back view of the ship, you can actually see the thrusters that allow it to have this incredibly, incredible ability to maneuver around the ocean. When you go inside the Alvin, you enter from the top and climb down this ladder. The inside is capable of seating one pilot and two scientists. When you go inside, there are three monitors. Going to the next picture, there are three monitors that allow the pilot to navigate. You can see the path the Alvin travels, the depth it goes, and the coordinates where it, where it is. The scientists are given this remote control. It really looks like a video game controller that allows them to maneuver the cameras and switch between cameras to see everything you're seeing. Going to the next picture, you can really see the size of Alvin. It's tiny. You can see the small windows we have for observing. And the right picture is actually the pilot. He has to hunch over to navigate the ship and steer it. That's kind of seemed much uncomfortable and wouldn't be great. Going to the next picture, you can see that above the monitors, there are all sorts of levers. I know that top panel of levers in, that are red were all the emergency releases. It allows the pilot of Alvin to drop everything but the metal sphere, and that metal sphere would just come back to the surface to keep everyone safe if anything malfunctions. And in the right picture, you can see the supply of oxygen Alvin goes down with. It has a three-day supply. The Alvin is able to dive to 4,500 meters. To put that in perspective a little bit, dive, scuba divers only dive to 40 meters. The maximum depth sunlight reaches is 11,000 meters, while the average depth of the ocean is 3,700 meters and the deepest point is 11,000 meters. See, I still don't grasp this distance. So here's a map of Raleigh. You can get from NC State to downtown Raleigh in 2.8 miles. And that's how far Alvin's capable of diving down. That's just incredible. The main challenge of diving this deep is the increasing pressure that is associated with the depth. Go ahead to the next, yeah. So it's constructed as a metal ball, so it will not collapse under the extreme pressure. We take advantage of this pressure change by bringing the decorated styrofoam cups down with us which shrink and become a great souvenir. I had the opportunity to dive and participate on the Baltimore Canyon dive, which had a maximum depth of about 500 meters. 
as an undergrad, I really did not expect to get the opportunity to, to, to dive down on the album. So when I found out I did, I was beyond excited. And as Leslie was saying, the weather conditions we had weren't ideal. So this is one of those short dives we, because we had to make two in one day. But that kind of made it feel like a mission. We had the same amount of scientific work to do, but we only had half the time to do it. We had to deploy the same number of instruments, collect the same number of samples, just quicker. So when I was getting in the Alvin, I know I was a little nervous. I knew what to expect since I ha had heard others dive experiences. However, it was a little different when I was doing it myself. I knew by going in Alvin, I was being a key part in collecting all the data we needed to answer the scientific questions being asked. It is like I'd received the training to do a job, but I'd never actually done it before. My nerves were up, but I was also extremely excited. To deploy the Alvin, they lifted up using this thick rope. I know this system kind of surprised me at first. The Alvin is this piece of equipment that costs millions of dollars, yet they lift it up using one rope. Now thinking about it, that kind of makes more sense since divers have to disconnect Alvin from the Atlantis. And that would be difficult if it was a more complex system. Once the Alvin was in the water, I remember bobbing around on the surface a bit before we started to descend and everything stabilized. As we were descending and once we reached the bottom, the pilot would commu periodically communicate back and forth with the ship. This descent was almost surreal. It, the light started to disappear and it started to turn dark and at which point the pilot turned the lights on. When I, when I tell this story to my family, the main thing they ask me is, was it scary? And honestly, once I was underneath the water, I felt very safe. I could see all the bioluminescence around and all the little creatures swimming around. It was things I had never seen before and I was really captivated by everything going on. I couldn't think of anything frightening. Once we were on the bottom, on my dive, we actually landed a little off target. So we weren't exactly at the cold seat site because current had pushed us. So the bottom was actually kind of barren. So it was interesting to see the, the C4 going to have nothing, to having dead muscles, and then becoming this explosion of life where every square centimeter was covered with muscle beds and that had crabs crawling on top of that and there's fish swimming around. That was really surprising to me to see at such an extreme depth. You can kind of see that biodiversity here in these pictures. You can see the octopus, and the mussel beds with bacterial mats, and then that fish called a chimera. As I was saying before, we didn't have a ton of time to deploy our instruments. You can see one of the instruments being deployed in the top right picture. It was amazing to see how the pilot could easily maneuver that arm as if it wasn't even an obstacle to him. Moving on to the next set of pictures, you can see the methane bubbles that were there. That was really interesting to see. There's bubbles all around. And the life at this depth weren't afraid of the sub at all. The crab you can see was crawling on our basket. And that fish caught a rat tail fish actually bumped into the sub and then just backed up as if nothing happened. On the way back to the surface, we had the opportunity to finish any dive notes while the experience was still fresh in our memory. We also could take some pictures in the sub once we reached the surface, a small boat came and towed us back to the Atlantis, at which point a diver hooked the rope back to Alvin, and we were pulled back aboard, and we told everyone what we saw, and everyone um, rushed to get all the samples off Alvin. Overall, the dive experience was really amazing, and to give you guys a better idea of our experiences and everything we saw at the bottom, I'm going to pass it off to Ian to show you guys a short video. Thanks, Aurora. That was great. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna give you guys a short uh, narration of about a four minute long video here. Um, and what we're gonna do here is kind of give you an idea of what it was like to dive via video instead of pictures and you trying to piece things together. And um, yeah, so uh, let's get started and uh, here we go. So this is Aurora and Dan getting in the sub here. And uh, this is the view that we all see uh, when we're coming out in the morning to see Alvin launch. There it is being lowered by the tethering rope and the 
swimmers, that's what we call them, swimmers, use this uh, phone there, which I'll talk about in a minute, a little later, to talk to the people in the sub, mainly the pilot. Here we are going in the water, and here we are. And actually, this little black area is actually a brine pool, which is something totally different I won't get into, but it's a fascinating um, uh, feature on the seafloor. Had a whole lot of these, uh, what we call boops, with fish coming up to the sub and hitting it. Nobody was scared of it, and they just didn't like touching it. You can see some shrimp walking around. Most of these are mussels. There's the probably one of the best shots we had of an octopus down below. This was that Florida escarpment. These are all hagfish, extremely slimy fish um, writhing around. They're eating this fish head, which you, you might be able to see. Um, they were a really fascinating sight. And here we are collecting our mussels. Uh, we would, it's maybe, maybe it seems kind of primitive, but all we do is scoop them up as many as we can. We tried to aim for about 50 per, per, uh, per site. And we just scoop them into what we call our bio box here. And, uh, we can only be so gentle with the, uh, robotic arm that we have and the limited time we have down there. But we kind of try to squeeze them in the bio box. We've got uh, two of them. Here are some tube worms, um, really interesting species, really interesting type of organism. It's a worm that lives in that solid tube and it filter feeds, so it filters the water that passes by it. Here's a curious little hagfish trying to get into our bio box because it smells food. Here's a little Galafayad swimming around, kind of had a Disney kind of feeling with that shot flying around the sub. This is one example of an animal that we, we can't identify. We don't know what it is. Kind of looks like what we call a salp, um, which is kind of just this gelatinous thing, but it was feeding on the sediment, which we don't know why. And there's one of the shots from earlier with the ophioroids uh, hanging around on the fan coral. Just a beautiful, very alien shot, in my opinion. Really encapsulates what it feels like to be down in the deep sea and, and look at things that aren't typically seen. And just another beauty shot of fish drifting by. This is at the Florida escarpment, a huge wall onto the continental plate. And uh, yeah, you could just pan over into darkness. And here we are coming up. I'm proud of these shots because you, you've, I, don't, I don't think they've been captured on any documentary anywhere. Just coming up, breaking the water. And then you can see the tugboat and uh, Al our Atlantis in the background. And this is the shot that everybody sees when they're surfacing and ready to come back on board. So the swimmers dive into the water to hop onto Alvin, and uh, they're using a wooden phone to talk to the people in the sub. There's the wooden phone there. This is a woman uh, named Max. She's amazing. Getting onto the sub and holding that wooden phone above the water the whole time so that uh, the wooden phone is uh, no electronics. So it makes sure that if, even if the sub is out of power, you can talk, but it has to be uh, kept out of water. That's why she's holding it up. Yeah, and then they attach this rope and just pull everybody up and the swimmers dive off. Looks like a fun part of the job. And we pull Alvin up, start uh, taking it back in with the crane. And that's it. That's it for the dive video. So thank you guys for listening. I hope that gave you a really good idea of what it was like to be there. Um, if we were to give you every detail and, and not to mention talk about all the research and all the uh, implications and different uh, spheres of it, we'd be here for multiple days. But uh, I hope you guys enjoyed listening to this. Uh, we're really looking forward to answering any questions you might have uh, or elaborating on anything you'd like us to talk more about. So thank you again. Look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much. Excellent job, all three of you. Amazing Thanks. stuff. I'm going to go ahead and remind everybody, uh, drop your questions and comments, just things you thought were cool or interesting, things you want to know more about inside the chat box. I've got it pulled up right here. I'll be grabbing and uh, sharing that with our guests. 
Uh, and there's already, there's a few, few questions coming in, in here now. Uh, I'm going to turn off the screen share real quick. Let me get to that. There we go. Now we can all be here together uh, to chat a little bit. So, uh, Ian, I am curious about uh, your research project in particular. Uh, what exactly you're hoping to study? Because you did the full three-week voyage. And so correct, yeah. what, what data were you collecting? Like, yeah. What were you getting so, off of Alvin? Mm -hmm, for sure. Yeah, so um, the project as a whole studies, uh, I guess I would say, just larval dispersal. And what that means is we're trying to study something that, one, you really can't see very well. Um, we're trying to study it in the deep sea, which is already difficult to access enough. Um, so you can imagine the difficulties we might have in trying to study something that's practically invisible, unless, of course, you use a microscope, um, in somewhere that's difficult to access and remote. Um, but so what we're studying is larval dispersal, and that means movement between seeps. And um, to study that, we have to understand a couple things. We have to understand the, the physiological aspects of dispersal. So can larvae swim, uh, or how do they swim, or how do they swim under certain conditions and in certain locations? We have to understand the physical oceanographic side of it, meaning what are the currents like? How do they change over time? Where are those currents? How far do they penetrate into the water column? And we have to understand the um, um, ecological or I guess biological aspect of it, which is connectivity. So the kind of ultimatum of those, those two factors, where do these larvae go? Um, does that change over time as well? There's a huge temporal aspect to it. Essentially, there's a whole ton of different things you have to research to answer, you know, th these questions. And um, I'm just one small part of it. Everybody on the ship is just one small part of it. Together, we'll answer that question. But to, to go back to your original question, what do I study specifically? What am I looking at? That is um, elemental composition, so geochemical inference of larval dispersal. And so what I collect are, are larvae. I'll collect larvae, but I'll also collect adult and juvenile shells because I can take those shells and I can look at their elemental composition over time to see if that composition changes over time to see if we're going to be looking at something that we can parse at all. If elemental composition changes so much over time that we can't actually um, find any patterns in it, then well, maybe what we're looking at isn't going to be so helpful. Um, looking at larval elemental composition, um, we're hoping to look at, can we, can we figure out where larvae came from? Can we see... Um, how their signature changes over time. Can we figure out if their composition changes with depth? Uh, there's a couple different aspects. But I, I stress I am just one small part of it. There are many other people working on it and uh, collecting different things to, to look at slightly different questions. So it's a complicated I my, answer. <laughs> well, I, I would expect it to be, yeah. Uh, but you, you mentioned connectivity here, and you talked about it at the beginning of the presentation too. But when I think of connectivity, I think about uh, terrestrial habitats. Sure. And it's really easy to say that two forest patches are no longer connected, so there's not dispersal. But in the ocean, where there's water between everything and everything moves through the water, like mm -hmm. I can imagine deer can't cross a street because that's dangerous. But a fish or a, or a larva moving from one oyster bed to another doesn't seem like things aren't connected. Y yeah, you, you wouldn't really imagine any barriers. Absolutely. Yeah, so there are barriers to dispersal. That's what we, we would term them as uh, in, the, in the deep sea, in the marine environment, in the terrestrial environment, everywhere. Um, yeah, of course, a deer can't really you know, cross a road because it's dangerous. If it does, it risks death. Um, and that's why we have these, these bridges um, to uh, allow you know, green bridges. Similarly, in the, in the deep sea, and that's the context I'll stick in, depth, we think, controls dispersal quite, quite significantly. And that means if you have a deep site and animals at that deep site, they may be more physiologically tuned to disperse in the deep. And they're not necessarily, we, we don't know, and this is the question we're trying to answer, but we, we hypothesize that they are not able to disperse to shallow areas because of the depth, because of physiological differences, because maybe currents restrict them from getting out of the deep um, or the lack of currents. We think they may uh, stay in this, what we call a benthic boundary layer, which is about 200 meters off the seafloor. 
um, because there, there are no currents to get up to shallower areas uh, or they don't have the physiological swimming capability or they don't spend long enough in the uh, water column to actually get up to the shallow areas. Um, something we call planktonic larval duration that I won't get into. But some um, other barriers that are more obvious uh, or more understandable include, for example, the Florida escarpment. If we're talking about regional differences between um, dispersal or barriers to dispersal, Gulf of Mexico and the Western Atlantic margin, the East Coast, don't share all the same species. Some species that we find in the Gulf of Mexico never reached the Western Atlantic margin. And we're not quite sure. We have ideas, but we're not quite sure. Um, one of the ideas is that the Florida escarpment, that wall that we saw in the, in the video there, means that you have a shallower uh, ridge that these larvae have to, from the deep, get over. So it's a hump that they have to travel over. And some of them just can't do it physiologically or just environmentally, you know, oceanographically, physically, they can't do it. Um, so maybe that serves as a barrier, a literal physical barrier they can't get across. Um, and there are other barriers, chemical barriers, uh, salinity, temperature, um, stuff like that. And the same goes for shallow sites. So we think there's this, this uh, distribution between, or this difference between shallow and, and deep sites. So one of the things we're looking at in terms of composition is do shells in deep sites have a different composition than those uh, at shallow sites? If so, well, we can pretty easily say that, yeah, well, you know, here's, here's evidence of these populations, these communities being very different. Maybe we can pretty safely say they don't, you know, swap individuals very often. Excellent, excellent stuff. Uh, Aurora, tell me a little bit about what you were doing while you were down in the sub. I mean, you mentioned, you know, you look out the, the porthole, and uh, you know you're you're collecting specimens and you're collecting data, but is that just sort of like I don't know ticking off how many octopus you see and how many sea stars you see on a you know on a sheet of paper as you're going along? Are you driving a robot arm to you know grab something, put it in the basket as you go? Uh, I imagine you had like a specific job to do. Well, you said you had a specific job to do when you're on the sub. So what was the like? play-by-play play when you were down uh, in the in Alvin? Yeah, so when we go down, before we go down, we have a meeting beforehand to come up with a dive plan. So we talk that over with the pilot beforehand. So he knows our plan beforehand. And we go down. And at first, you just explore the site, get to the target. And once you find a good place, you go ahead and deploy your instruments and collect a couple scoops of the mussels so we can go ahead and get all that collected. And if there's extra time, that's when you really maneuver the cameras and maneuver the site to see what's going on. Okay, I see. So the, you, it, everything is laid out. You're not just sort of like getting to the bottom and going, all right, let's find a thing. That, that makes a lot of of more sense. If I can interject, there is some level of that, <laughs> which I always kind of found interesting. But uh, yeah, as Aurora said, we have a meeting beforehand the night before, and we talk about the, the dive objectives. Um, but once we're down there, we want to, um, the first priority is to be able to deploy the instruments. We want to deploy the instruments. Uh, they're going to collect larvae. They're going to, um, in some cases, collect seawater for us to um, analyze and, and larvae over time um, and other organisms to uh, study later and collect at a later time. Um, so we want to get those down on the, on the ground. Then we want to collect the mussels. We want to use the scoop, or at the very least, uh, in some situations, use the, the claw, the arm, to pick up the mussels and put them in the bio box. And we want to get about 50 per site, um, just so we can have enough to work with and share between all of our groups. And then we want to suction sample. We want to get this essentially a vacuum down and suction the, the, in between the mussels. And that lets us get some sediment. That lets us get some larvae. Um, we don't really care about the sediments, the larvae. Collect all of this stuff with the water um, and bring it up to sort through later. And that takes hours to sort through, as Leslie had discussed. Uh, but those are our main objectives. After that, we could do anything from, oh, well, um, you know, one of the PIs want us, wants us to go and try to find this uh, mooring that they deployed a couple of years ago but never found again. Um, uh, we come across some things. Oh, look, there's a site that was used for a previous study. You can see all their equipment. Um, 
oh, we want to collect, you know, this animal. We've never seen it before. Let's, let's collect it. Let's see what this is. Let's see if we can study it. So there's definitely some spontaneity and, and some opportunistic sampling and research uh, that happens as soon as you're down on the floor. And a lot of the dive is spent, you know, looking for where you want to settle down and, and uh, get your samples. Yeah, and I was actually going to bring it to Leslie next because I wanted to hear a little bit more about working in the lab uh, and sort of w what your job was. Did you have the same lab position each day on the cruise? So was it all day, every day in the microscope for the same person? Uh, or did you get to move around and do different jobs, learn different skills? It was pretty flexible, especially with the sorting team. There's so much to do. You could be... Um, looking into a microscope for hours at a time, which I, I'm not that great at. Aurora is much better at it than I am. <laughs> She's a real trooper. <laughs> she'll, she'll be in there sorting through a microscope for, for a long time, but I had to get out and move around. And so I sort <laughs> some of the macroinvertebrates, shrimp, things like that. Um, I helped Ian out with uh, wrapping up some of his shells. I just kind of bounced all over the place. So while my main job was sorting, I, I went wherever the wind took me. Nice. <laughs> Okay, uh, I asked too many questions, and I've taken up too much time. There are questions over here in the chat. Okay, uh, Megan wants to know, uh, if you arrived slightly off the off target of your collection site, did you just collect there, or did you traverse to your original landing site? That's a really good question. So um, in an optimal dive, meaning basically the dives we had in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, because of weather. We were slammed with terrible weather, wind, and, and high waves, and terrible conditions right about when Aurora and Leslie got on uh, at Fort Lauderdale. And um, yeah, they, they brought the bad weather with them, and uh, they had a really good introduction to uh, living on a rocking ship as soon as they got on. But anyways, no, so we would prefer, uh, Megan, when we go down to be able to have time to look for a optimal site to, to, to collect our samples. Meaning, you know, do we want to collect these muscles? Why do we want to collect these muscles? Let's spend some time and think about it. Where do we want to place our equipment down? Um, you, we want to make sure we're laying things down on a flat surface. We don't want to put our equipment right on the muscles. So we want to find a place that's in a high density muscle area. You know, it's not barren, but we also don't want to have to place our equipment on muscles. So we have to kind of, you know, there's some qualifiers there. We would prefer to have time to look for, you know, that kind of optimal spot for sure. We don't always have that time. So a lot of the dives that we had on the East Coast were um, yeah, every dive's a mission, but they really felt like, you know, extremely time sensitive missions. Um, we had only three or four hours, I think. Um, and that was on the long end uh, for those dives. In the Gulf of Mexico, we could spend, I think it was six, seven, maybe eight hours down. I, I think at least six or seven hours down and, and you'd eat lunch just down there and, and be able to, some people even have the chance to just take some free time and, and drive the sub, the pilot that let them drive the sub. Um, my dive, Aurora's dive, uh, we did not have that luxury. We, we had to go down as fast as possible. Sometimes we placed things in areas we'd really rather not, but we, that was the best site we could find. It, there was a high chance of the dive aborting. We'd never be able to deploy stuff. So we just did. So excellent question. Yeah. Sometimes we, we would prefer to have that luxury, but we don't always. Now, I think about the time that we saw the swimmers jump into the water after bringing Alvin back aboard. Uh, Kelly asked, what is the water temperature? Good question. Um, I'm not sure. This was in uh, February, March. Uh, of course, when you get around Florida, everything warms up a lot. Uh, it was noticeably warmer. Um, we never got in the water, so I didn't know how bad it was. <laughs> but uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, there was a whole lot of uh, swim trunks and um, you know, not having to wear a wetsuit and stuff. Uh, the East Coast was wetsuits and full hoods. So it, it gets it gets cold when you're not directly in the Gulf Stream or when you're, you know, a little north in you know, Baltimore area or not around Florida. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see here. Oh, this is a great one. They said, this is great. Thanks. Thanks. Do you have, okay. Uh, do you have any specific results and conclusions you can draw from your research yet or is it too soon? Yeah, it's too soon. Um, so actually the pandemic means that I can't even analyze my samples yet. I, getting even further into my research, the okay. way we look at elemental composition is, is with this thing called, um, I'll take a deep breath, laser ablation plasma mass spectrometry. 
which means that I have to go to a facility that has a very fancy machine that I have to stick my uh, samples in it and, and shoot a laser at them and it'll tell me what, what's in the shell. Uh, but I can't do that. So yeah, it is too early, unfortunately. Um, we, we expect uh, to find, uh, like I had mentioned, differences in composition between shallow and deep sites, uh, between regions, between the Gulf of Mexico and the East Coast, Western Atlantic margin. Um, meaning we would, we would uh, be in support of this isolation by depth um, and isolation by, by marine barrier to dispersal theory. Ultimately too early though. All right, all right. Next up, uh, are you seeing any degradation in the shell composition at that depth? Yeah, so there are, yeah, that's a, a question that is more, yeah, we see, mortality, we, see, we see shell mortality, meaning animals have eaten the shells, eaten the mussels. Um, we see uh, dead shells, live shells. We see some areas that are so populated that shells are stacked feet on top of each other, just stack upon stack upon stack upon stack. Um, in some areas, there are no mussels at all or just you know, scattered, broken shells. Um, there's a, if I'm understanding the question correctly, there's a wide variety of, of habitats that are shell based, but not necessarily live, not necessarily dead. And the some that are mixed as well. That can also depend on methane seepage. So you can have a methane seep that's really active versus one that's dead. And, and it's not going to you know, be a chemosynthetic community without the, the chemical part of it. All right. Here's one for Aurora. Did you have any strategies for handling feelings of panic once you were deep below an Alvin, if they occurred? Yeah, so before we actually go down in Alvin, they let you have a sub tour and the pilot walks you through each step of the dive. Also, the Alvin crew is really great with first-hand divers. They understand the nerves, they know what it's like. So they really get that human element and keep you calm. Nice. That's, that's nice to hear. Um, we actually had one of our museum researchers recently, um, one of our astrophysicists of all people, right? Somebody who studies the stars uh, for a documentary, they went down an Alvin. Uh, they were able to do like one of these eight hour dives. They had to pack sandwiches, I recall from, from the documentary, but similarly, she, she shared a similar story of like being really nervous up to the point of meeting the crew and, and the people who were in charge of safety and making sure that everything went according to plan. And then at that point it felt great because they're such a highly skilled trained team. Okay. Uh, let me see. There's more popping up here. Was your research project the only one being conducted on this trip? And if not, how many different projects were represented? Yeah, so that goes back to the, the first question is, yeah, there's a ton of people working on this project. So actually we have University of Oregon, we have University of Washington. We did some things for uh, researchers that were um, not associated with our crews, but wanted you know some samples because when you have a ship going out and using Alvin to collect samples, everybody wants a piece of the cake and, and why not? If we can collect some samples that you want and we're down there sure. and you know, we look out the window, yep, we can collect those samples, we'll do it. <laughs> um, there are a lot of projects involved um, with, with the work we're doing. This is a NSF funded research cruise. It's extremely expensive. And the way we get it funded is having a bunch of people in the pot uh, working on different things. So it's, yeah, mine is absolutely not the, uh, not the most important part of the cruise. It's not the only part of the cruise. Uh, everybody's involved uh, together. Here's one for Leslie, actually. What data were you examining once you were on board and how did you generate data? That's a great question. Um, it all, so with, with the sorting team, it was a lot of counting. So um, uh, we, would, we would go through the macro invertebrates and, and we, we pretty much had a tally, kind of like how you said before, like, is it going down and counting how many octopus? Yeah, it's, it's like that for sorting. We got up to like 200, 300 snails at one point. 
Um, so it's, it's a lot of counting to 100 and starting back over again, <laughs> um, <laughs> making notes of different kind of animals or, or any kind of fauna that were, that were down there. Um, counting how many larvae they were, were they alive? Uh, were they dead? Um, just observations about the things that we were counting as well. Did you have a preferred job? Like, was it great to be in this, like on the bio box team? Cause you mentioned a little bit about uh, the suction team, I think. Yeah. It was like, you didn't want to be there. I'm, I, I would not want to be on the suction team. Uh, the people who are on the suction team are wonderful people and they have powerful lungs and I'm very happy for them. And they were very proud of their job. Very proud. Um, favorite job though. I, I don't know. It would probably have to be the macroinvertebrate sorting because you reach your hand down there and there's a bunch of goop and gunk. And, but there's also some really cool deep sea shrimp that are mostly see-through with the exception of, I, I think a heart or something like that. But getting to see the different creatures down there, the bio box, I helped out with the bio box team once because Aurora, it was actually for Aurora's dive. I subbed in for her. I tagged in. Uh, it's really cold. It's really cold to reach your hands down there. Uh, we'd have to take shifts because at one point our hands are hurting and red. <laughs> it's like, I can't move my hand. Somebody, somebody help me out. I'll take a bucket in if somebody will jump in the bio box. Um, but that was also a really fun job if you could get past the hand portion. Also worth mentioning a lot of the um, yeah. stuff we do on board isn't so much analysis. It's um, just collection, collection, storage, making sure our, our samples are safe and secure and, and they're not going to just, you know, break up or um, get damaged in any, in any way, uh, preserve things as quickly as we can. Um, most of it, is, you know, with the exception of, for example, like we might scan a site with um, um, side scan sonar or something like that, but most of it's storing our samples and it takes, you know, 18 hours out of your day. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, we're over time, but there's just a few more here that I, that I'll get to, uh, cool. if, as long as y'all are good with it. Absolutely. Uh, did you leave any equipment to generate ongoing data? Yeah. Either of you want to take that? Cause you, I think you probably know. I can answer it if uh, you'd like me to. Yeah. So we actually, um, deployed larval traps and they're going to stay down there till a future cruise where you can pick them back up. And we left a current meter, so that way you can see what the current will be as the larval setting settling. Uh, that current meter is just a, it's it's a, a tube attached to a weight, uh, and and what's attaching it is a string, and that, that current meter can then just like that, you know, move over with with uh, you know whatever current it experiences. It's got a magnetometer, accelerometer, stuff like that. That's for the physical side of our of our research. The larval traps are for the physiological side. Collecting muscles is for the, the elemental side, my side, as well as um, uh, other molecular and isotope research that are that's going on. Um, yeah, we did. We left quite a few instruments down there at each site. Mary wants to know if you see any major differences in Gulf data versus the Atlantic, uh, and in particular, wanted to know about the invertebrates. Ooh, I wish I could... Uh, I wish I could answer that in more detail. There are other people on the cruise that would just instinctively know that <laughs> in more detail than I do. Um, I'm not sure how well I can answer that question. There, there are um, species differences, um, community composition differences between the Gulf and between the, the Western Atlantic margin. Um, for example, tube worms, you won't find those on the East Coast. You'll only find those on the, in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, some mussel species... For example, um, I think it's, well, so for example, there's one called Bathymodiolus childersi, which is a, a small-ish muscle, but you'll find that in both regions. However, you might not find um, Bathymodiolus brooksi in both regions. And they look similar, but if you look at their um, DNA to actually identify their species, they're, they're two different species. You also might find this really fascinating muscle called uh, Bathymodiolus hecari. This muscle is about yay long. It's, you can get up to like 27 centimeters uh, and it kind of curves like that. It's so, so large. And, and where it ends, it's got this little kind of curvy end to it. Um, 
kind of looks like a boomerang. There's another, another muscle called bathymodialis boomerang, different story. But um, yeah, you will find these muscles uh, in, in different regions. They don't always share the region. Um, invertebrate wise, um, outside of muscles, yeah, I'm not entirely sure, unfortunately. But uh, I, I think it's safe to say, yeah, there are certain differences. I'm just not sure what they are. Leslie, did you see, since they mentioned invertebrates, uh, in, in doing your uh, data sampling and collecting, between data sets, would you see big changes in comp species composition, or did you get a lot of the same stuff every time? It was mostly a lot of the same stuff. Unfortunately, I was only there for the East Coast portion, uh, so I didn't mm -hmm. see anything about the Gulf. Um, but it did vary between between sites that we looked at uh, because there were some sites that had majority of snails and brittle stars. And there were some where you had more shrimp or there weren't a lot of brittle stars. So the variation in species, it was there between different sites because we went um, like off the coast of North Carolina to off the, co off the coast of Maryland, just in that general area. So there were differences. Um, but I have no idea about the Gulf, unfortunately. Sure, sure. All right. Uh, okay, the last one that I see here, I may have missed some. I apologize to all the viewers if I missed any. Okay, uh, Kelly's asking, how big was that salp? Um, yeah, Ian's yeah, laughing, he sure knows what's going on. Yeah, it was big. Um, I wasn't on that dive. I don't remember how big they said it was. If I had to guess... Mm, I almost don't want to guess because I'm not sure. I would imagine something like that if I had to guess. I'm not sure. The main interesting part about it is, yeah, it appeared to be a salp, which is just, you know, this gelatinous filter-feeding organism that just floats through the water. Um, but it was very obviously feeding on the sediment and kind of scraping up against the sediment as it was. And nobody had seen that behavior before, at least on our cruise uh, and it just surprised us. Kind of similarly, there were some other organisms that surprised us. We found this enormous um, lobster. Um, it was, I think, like white, bluish, absolutely enormous. It had these extremely long claws, uh, and it, it displayed this very territorial or aggressive defensive behavior <laughs> where it you know, flipped out its claws and looked at the sub, and it was, it was a gigantic creature uh, compared to the size of the sub. And uh, it digs these burrows. So we'd come across these um, almost like pear-shaped uh, convex burrows. Um, and wherever we saw one of those burrows, we'd later see the, the lobster itself. And it was the, we called it the pit fiend. It has a reputation down there with us now as a, as a creepy organism, <laughs> but also very interesting. <laughs> That's great. That is amazing. All right. Well, I think that is... Oh, wait, 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 wait. Because uh, the museum's marine biologist is on the stream now. Oh boy, we have some. We have a professional. <laughs> yeah, there's a professional. Uh, Megan McCuller saying that maybe the maybe it was a sea cucumber. Uh, sea cucumber, the um, salp looking thing. I'm I'm guessing. Possibly, um, yeah, possibly. I'm not sure. I'm not. I don't have the experience to to say one way or the other. We did see sea cucumbers. Um, a whole bunch of them would. Uh, float into the camera. I would have loved to show you some videos uh, we have uh, of that happening. Yeah. Um, again, I'm not sure. I don't think. I don't think we landed on that. It was a sea cucumber, but mm -hmm. I could be wrong. Others could be wrong. I'm not sure. We did see uh, did see sea cucumbers. That's a tongue twister. Um, those were interesting to see. Is going down in the deep sea. It's it's fascinating because you you. Inexperienced as I was, uh, as Aurora was, and and so on, we don't know what half the things down there are. Even studying the deep sea, you, know, you still don't. Um, and then you still see organisms that you haven't described yet. We we saw a sponge. We picked up a sponge that um, yeah. Oh, we we, we saw it. We, we said, oh yeah, that's a sponge. But then we brought it back up on board and we looked at it. And it has this hard exterior. That's not sponge like. <laughs> and and on the inside, it was soft. And so we didn't know what to describe that as. We saw another, um, we thought it was a brittle star, but it turned out not to be. Um, and we picked that up as well. Every which way you look, there are organisms you haven't described yet, you haven't found yet, you haven't discovered yet. Um, 
and it, and it opens up a lot of questions and it, it really leaves this air of mystery when you dive. All right. Well, we'll leave it there. Again, thanks all three of you for giving us your insight and expertise on the life on the ship, on the sub, the research that's going on. Uh, that is that's so cool that you, that you all got to experience all of that. So thanks, Chris. Much I'm glad you enjoyed it. to you. I'm Take me next time. It. Yeah, we'll do. Yeah, we'll try. I'm gonna hold. You know, with this. I'm gonna hold you to. <laughs> they be they nice. don't. They don't. I only exist in this box on the internet, so it might be difficult. No joke. <laughs> All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'll remind everyone watching: you can subscribe to the museum's YouTube channel. The button should just be right there, and then click the bell next to it to get notified of when the museum is posting new videos and going live with programs just like this one. So you don't even have to update your calendar. Just click the bell. You'll get notified next Wednesday at noon when we're going live with this program, as well as all of the other great programs that we offer out of the Museum of Natural Sciences. Uh, this program, of course, brought to you by us, the museum, our team, as well as the team at the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education. Many thanks to those folks for helping put on this program every single week as well. You can follow the Lunchtime Discovery series at a hashtag on Twitter, Lunchtime Discovery. And you can follow the Office of Environmental Education at North Carolina EE. And then, of course, follow the museum. We're at Natural Sciences on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. All kinds of great science and nature content for you every day of the week. Until next time, uh, take care, everybody. Stay safe. We'll see you again real soon. Bye, everyone.